Welcome to Beverage's Weekly Table Talks. These are panel discussions put on each week to bring people closer in touch with the world of spirits. We bring together some of the brightest minds and best names in the industry to discuss the latest happenings across premium drinks. Past topics have included things like investing in whiskey, the history of the old-fashioned cocktail, the impact of terroir on distilling, and more. These go live each week on Wednesday at 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 5.45 p.m. Pacific. I'm your host today, Lou Bryson. I'm the author of Whiskey Masterclasses. Well, <laughs> as you can see over my shoulder. Uh, I'm also the author of Tasting Whiskey, another whiskey book. And I was the uh, managing editor of Whiskey Advocate Magazine for 20 years, helping to shape the voice of whiskey writing. And now I'm uh, freelancing and drinking whiskey and talking about it. Today we have a really interesting panel for you. Today is, why is this whiskey Irish? Um, I have a bottle of Irish whiskey here. I have many other bottles of Irish in my house. What makes them Irish? To help me with that today, we have two guests, Donald Gallagher from uh, Glendalough Distillery and Alan Glynn from Dingle Distillery, uh, two very experienced voices. We're going to have quite a bit to say about this, and I, I hope you enjoy it. Perfect, perfect. Great to be there with you. There we go. You. And uh, go. I just have to say, Lou, that pronunciation, that your pronunciation was fantastic. So <laughs> 10, 10 out of 10 for that, because I know we like to make things uh, hard to pronounce in Ireland. Well, you know, so, we've uh, talked yeah. quite a few times, so I've, I've, I've had a chance to get it right. <laughs> Alan, I, we haven't met before. It's, uh, it's really good to meet you. No, pleasure to meet you as well. Delighted to be here and uh, always interested in having a good chat about whiskey. Well, sorry, water, but I do have I do have whiskey here. Fantastic, good to hear. Yeah, in fact, today I'm uh, I'm drinking uh, one of Donald's. Uh, this is the Glendalough Pot Still, aged in Irish oak. I figured I'd try and get as Irish as I could. Um, so we have a, a long-standing question today: What is it that makes an, a whiskey an Irish whiskey? Uh, Scotch whiskey is tightly bound by regulations, as is American bourbon and rye. Japanese whiskey not currently as tightly bound, but has been straightly guided by tradition that largely hews to the Scottish model. Canadian whiskey has a unique approach to blending that makes it different. But like the Japanese, they have a firm idea of where they should be. Um, but Irish whiskey, uh, you make a grain whiskey in a column still or a single malt whiskey in a, in a pot still, or the still largely unique to Ireland single pot still whiskey with unmalted barley, in any of the farthest reaches of the island, bottle them singly or blended, peated or unpeated, double or triple distilled, aged in used or new oak barrels, and it's all Irish whiskey. So <laughs> I don't know if our guests have ever really thought about it, but when you pick up a bottle of Irish whiskey, just what is it that makes it Irish? It, 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 surely it's more than whiskey made in Ireland, and that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, both of you if you could make a... Uh, an opening statement about, well, you know, who you are, the distillery, the the whiskeys you make, and and maybe a, a first cut at that question. Uh, Alan, you want to start? Uh, yeah, delighted to. Um, so my name is Alan Glynn. I'm the international brand ambassador for the Dingle Distillery. The Dingle Distillery is a small independent distillery in the southwest of Ireland in Dingle in County Kerry. <clears throat> if anybody may have seen Dingle before, it's a beautiful coastal town we're the most westerly distillery in the country so we're the closest uh, we can say to the united states <laughs> but, uh, um, and we've started distilling from 2012 so we opened our distillery in 2012 delighted to say as of uh, december this year we will have 10 year old whiskey and yes. just like just like glendalough we were one of the the first of the new wave of distilleries in, uh, in ireland I suppose when you ask the question of what is um, what is Irish whiskey, like you can simplify it by saying it is really whiskey that's coming from Ireland. But I think culturally and heritagely, it's a lot more important to us. Like it's a big part of our history and the, the, what made our country itself from our community values being based in public houses, being pubs, from everything that we've done within our own towns. Like it's a representation of Ireland, our grain, our people and everything else. So it has, we're, we're so lucky to have such amazing freedom to play around with different types of casks, to play around with different types of mash bills, peated, unpeated. So it's definitely something that can be 
a lot more exciting because we can have a bit more fun with it. But Irish whiskey really is the whiskey that's come from Ireland and what we use to express. And we've been lucky in Ireland to have a growth of distilleries and we're seeing so many different expressions and so many different things that it's bringing life to an industry that was quite quiet for a long time. Great. great. Uh, Donald. I think that's over to me. Yeah, so, so my name is Donald O'Gallacor. I'm uh, one of the founders of the Glendalough Distillery. And uh, over a little over a decade ago now, myself, my cousin and three friends, uh, we, we packed in our, our day jobs and we, we, we set up one, one of the first craft distilleries in Ireland. And uh, as Alan said, we've been part of this sort of uh, new wave um, of sort of revival and rebirth of Irish whiskey and Irish distilling. And, uh, you know, our sort of mindset in setting up the distillery was always to make remarkably different Irish whiskies because there was Irish whiskey at that time. Um, it was sort of overlooked and it was underrepresented uh, around the world. And a lot of people had this assumption that Irish whiskey was typically blended, typically bourbon cask aged, and was typically in that light and sweet and so all of our whiskies, we don't do anything blended. Uh, they're all singular in style, uh, which we can sort of get into the, the, the style aspect. Uh, they're barrel by barrel aged, non-chill filtered, and we're sort of hunting these flavor profiles that are not represented, that show variety and show difference uh, within the category of Irish whiskey. And I think we took a lot of uh, inspiration from what was happening in the uh, craft bourbon revival where a lot of uh, wannabe distilleries and new distilleries and all that, they looked at their own heritage and they sort of brought back weeded bourbon, single barrel bourbon, looking at these old ryes. And I think that sort of gets in my roundabout way to, to the point of like what, what makes Irish whiskey Irish whiskey. And it, it, it sort of gets to when, because whenever you sort of look at Irish whiskey, there's the rise of, there's the rise of Irish whiskey from early distillation in these monastic settlements and then there's the, the massive like glory days, the growth, which is from like the late 1600s onwards to the early 1900s. And that's, you know, when you look at the these big, heavy pot still, single malt, aged and rare price cash, sherry, Madeira and port. You look at the, the fall of Irish whiskey in the early 1900s with, uh, you know, prohibitions, world wars, domestic turmoil, all of that. And then you look at the sort of rebirth of Irish whiskey, which sort of started with this, uh, lighter blended style that sort of popularized Irish whiskey and now we're sort of in 2.0 uh, where people are looking at the three styles of whiskey that you can make on the island of Ireland uh, single grain single pot still single malt they're looking at double distillation triple distillation they're looking at innovations around mash bills and you know di different historic grains that were used different like all of that and then you look at the, the actual aging of it and the different breeds of not just oak, but wood that can be used within distillation or within, within Irish whiskey. So in the technical file, it doesn't just have to be oak. It can be different species of, of wood as well. So if you look at uh, the island of Ireland versus, um, you know, say Scotland, our neighbours, there's only two styles of whiskey you can make in Scotland, single grain, single malt and blends thereof. Now, if you, there's a third style within, within Irish whiskey, and then you look at, you know, smoked whiskey or peated whiskey versus unpeated and the, the variety of different casks and woods that are available. There's just a whole universe of innovation that's starting to come down the line now. I, I swear you're looking over my shoulder. That was the, the first question I had teed up. It, compare oh, I, Irish I, whiskey I, I, to Scott. Yeah, I, you're I, in I, my I, room, I'm aren't you? There. You're yeah, in the house. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what I thought. Yeah. That's, <laughs> so as you pointed out, Irish whiskey has a, essentially a, a third whiskey to play with. Mm -hmm. Um, making more possibilities. Does that make it? I don't know. Does that make it easier to find to define Irish whiskey or harder? I think it's harder, um, and I think that's. Made, I think that gives more um, variety and innovation of what you what you can do. So it, it's very difficult to pigeonhole Irish whiskey. Historically, uh, people had, and, and you know, if, if you look at the most recent 70s, 80s, 90s, into the early 2000s, Irish whiskey was pigeonholed in terms of a certain style, a certain flavor profile. But now, you know, th there's no hold bars in terms of. Yeah, I mean, a large part of that is because that. We, we were down to, I mean, two distilleries, two and a half. Uh, well, I mean, all, all, all fairness, it wasn't putting out a hell of a lot of whiskey, right? 
and it took yeah. a while to get going. But um, and meanwhile, you know, Middleton was just steamrolling. Um, you know, no, I mean, if you've got it was the, necessary. It was it, Middleton was needed to do that at yeah. the time. Yes, they kept the category alive, and we can't ever look it back. It amazes yeah, me like, how I, tiny the category got in the seventies. Yeah. It almost like, died like, for God's sake. None of us would be here talking about this if it wasn't for the middle Middleton Distillery keeping the category yep. alive uh, throughout the, the the you know when every other distillery in Ireland was shut. You know, if you look at the forties, fifties, sixties, it was just every distillery closing. Yeah. Um, and then in the late sixties, the remaining distillers and families came together to, to create the Middleton Distillery and essentially um, created that that blended Irish whiskey style that kept the category alive. Um, so yeah, look, hats off to them, and you, you know, and I, then I think also put a ton of money into wood research, which mm -hmm. I don't. I, I do not think is appreciated greatly in the, I don't know, the wider whiskey community. Um, they were, they were way out ahead on the whole, um, you know, tracking barrels, seeing how, when a yeah. barrel wore out. And, and I, I try to give them credit for that. Every well, I time suppose, I talk about this. I suppose you're only, we're only really now seeing the impact of what they did so long ago. And that can be the thing with whiskey is you're not seeing what they're doing. Yeah. Now, what was done in the past and you're looking at the future. And I think to understand like what has happened in Irish whiskey, and as you talk about the the single malt, the blended or the pot still, is to for those who are probably listening who don't fully understand the Irish categories in themselves, single malt meaning a malt of one um, of one malt of barley, a blend a mash bill of one of one barley. Blended is a mixture of grain and single malt and single malt together, which creates a blended category. But probably the most interesting one to talk about is single pot still in Ireland or pot still. And this, where the necessity of it came from is to understand Irish whiskey and probably the Irish psyche and the Irish personality in itself. The best description I can always give for a single pot still or pot still is that if you were to work for me a couple of hundred years ago and you were to work in my distillery, a Friday came and I'd pay you, but I didn't pay you in cash. I handed you a bottle of whiskey. So I turned around and I said, there you go, Lou. Thanks very much for your work this week. And you'd go down to the local store and you'd hand in that bottle and they'd give you credit or they'd give you money for it. And that was your payment for the week. But at the time, whiskey started to take off. Well, we first had the precursor of Putin in Ireland being our initial distillate, which Glendalough did a fantastic job when they launched the distillery. Um, but it became, the whiskey came from this. And before even aging was even known, this is what we were making. But um, when they said, we started to see an explosion of whiskey, we had some visitors in this country. Um, from just the other side of us, from yourselves, called the English. And uh, they were taxing us, and they were taxing the, the population, popularity of the whiskey. And they started taxing the bottles leaving the distillery. But I could get away with not paying tax on the bottles I was paying my employees. So if I had 10 employees, you're damn sure I was telling them I had 20, and I wasn't paying. <laughs> <laughs> but they copped on to it. They copped on to what we were doing. They said, fine, we're not going to tax the bottles leaving. We're going to start taxing the grain coming in. And like I said, this yeah. is the definition of the Irish psyche because it showed our two, I'm not going to say our greatest, our two most famous traits of being stubborn and rebellious. And we went, fine, you can tax the grain coming in. We're going to start using unmalted grain. And thus, pot still was born and this good gave us pot still. And we're so lucky to have uh, pot still as a GI, a great geographical indicator of Ireland that anybody else in the world can make that blend, but they cannot call it pot still. And that obviously just gives us so much important and makes it like the quintessential Irish product, but now we're seeing the evolution of distilleries and we're seeing everybody doing their work. I said we were at two, we're now up to 47, which is amazing in Ireland. It's, it's it really is a revival and it's a fantastic time. But now we're seeing single malts becoming more apparent, single grains, everything becoming far more apparent in Ireland. And it's given amazing energy to the industry mm -hmm. and to everyone involved in it. Now we go to a Whiskey Live in the US, or we go to a whiskey show in, I was in Poland a couple weeks ago, and we see all these Irish brands coming and they're bringing new life and they're exciting and they're interesting and it's fantastic to see. I, I gotta say the last event I went to before uh, the pandemic lockdown in 2020 was a um, an Irish whiskey uh, exhibit in, in Philadelphia. Uh, I think there were 15 uh, brands, distillers there. It was yeah. the most exciting event I'd been to in months. It was fantastic. I just walked around the room kind of in a, in a daze looking at all this new stuff. People doing new things, new pot still whiskeys. It was great. It was fantastic. And, and uh, <clears throat> wood experiments and blending experiments. It was great. I was, uh, I was I'm very impressed. You can't keep up with that at the moment. Every week yeah. is a new launch. 
it, it, it's this phenomenal energy uh, within Irish whiskey. Like I can remember when I first moved over here uh, to the US and w- was selling Irish whiskey and was trying to get listings in liquor stores and all of that. There's literally two, maybe three bottles. And you'd walk by like an Isle of Scotch, uh, you know, an Isle of Vodka, Isle of that. And there was like a shelf of Irish whiskey. It was like, it was like yeah. that. And now it's, it's, a, it's not quite an aisle yet, but it's, it's a, you know, there's a couple it's of a books. Prop, and it's, it's starting to be defined more as a proper category. Because if you look at our Scottish neighbours, they have Highlands, Lowlands, Isla, Speyside in their single malts. They have your mainstream blends and then your, your more of your discount blends that are more price sensitive. In Irish whiskey, we just had three, as I said. But now you're starting to see, you know, the single malt category be, be developed, the single pot still category being developed your mainstream blends, even single grain, which we work in as well, um, yeah. you know, th- that being developed. So it's actually becoming a proper category and you can actually visually see that in liquor stores. But one thing I just wanted to say on, on Alan's point there, you know, a lot of, you know, we lo- in Irish whiskey will always talk about, um, you know, the glory days. I, you know, Irish whiskey used to be this, this, this huge producer of whiskeys. Uh, used to be exported to every corner of the globe. It was dominant uh, imported whiskey into the US right up until Prohibition. It was the drink of royalty and all of this uh, aristocrats and all that. But the style of whiskey itself was is very different to what most people think Irish whiskey is, which is that lighter blended style. It was very big, very viscous, very robust, either single malt or single pot still. And yeah. there was some sort of um, interchangeable notions. And you see a lot of the old uh, memorabilia has pure malt or vatted malt or old, old malt. And, you know, so barley's king. Uh, whether it's 100% malted barley or malted and unmalted barley. But, and then it was that style, big, heavy, and then aged in your rare prize cast, your sherry, Madeira, your port. And so, like, when people think Irish whiskey back in the day, that's what I think of these big huge chewy whiskeys that have a fortified uh wine cast to them yeah it's great i mean you see that coming back in uh scotch as well you know i mean the uh the blends were from what everything i've read not having been alive in the late 1800s were a a reaction to single malts being too flavorful um Mm. too much and you wanted to to blend it to make it more acceptable to a large number of people and now we're coming back to that where, I mean, people want the biggest, beefiest malts they can find. Um, mm. Talking about single pot still, I, um, I I still remember the first time I ever walked into uh, Middleton when they were um, brewing a uh, single pot still. I've been in, I, I read about beer as well, so I can't even take a guess at how many breweries I've been in, how many distilleries I've been in. I never smelled anything like that. It was a, a completely unique experience. And if I hadn't gone, I wouldn't have known. But all of a sudden, single pot still whiskey made a lot more sense. You're getting all mm-hmm. those um, different esters from the from the raw barley and that the fermentation of that being converted by the by the malt. It was it was incredible. Um, is there I don't know, is there is there can you can you say that single pot still is is even more Irish than than most whiskeys, I, and I don't want to get into it. You know, uh, this is this isn't, but I mean, it seems to be the most Irish whiskey there is. Well, I, I think it's the the quintessential Irish whiskey. It's what made the name of Irish whiskey around the world. Uh, it's a style that is the defining point that can't be made anywhere else. So you know, I, I would say yes. You know, I think it's the, the most Irish of all Irish whiskeys is Austin. Definitely, it definitely is, but it, it's it's a job for the likes of Don, likes myself, even likes yourself, Leroy, now is to explain that category and people to understand that category because they don't know it necessarily exists. It's people very confusing. Talking. Yeah, and that's that's probably our own fault as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's terminology. I mean, you know, yeah. when, the, when the Scots and, went from vatted malt to blended malt, everyone's like, you had a name, it worked. Why'd you do <laughs> <laughs> no, people know single malt so well, especially because yeah. they've been by Scotch whiskey for so long. So now you mm. can tell you can talk to people about even, and it's not an international thing; it's a thing in Ireland as well. I can talk to somebody about pot still whiskey, and they won't know what it is. But I'll right. mention a red breast, for example, and they go, "I love red breast," and you go, "Well, that's a pot. That's a pot still. So that's what it is." Now mm. I can speak from my own experiences within our distillery. So one big thing for our distillery is that we do everything by hand. It's not by choice by all of us. <laughs> 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 which, which literally getting into, 
which includes literally getting into the mash tun to dig it out by hand. Oh, yeah. And I know the days that I'm working in the distillery or the days I'm in the distillery and I hear Potsdam mentioned, I'm like, oh, God. Because I'm not there all the time, so the times I'm there, I'm, I have to jump in and dig it out. And I know I can tell you that digging out the spent spent mash. That's why I write. I was I yeah. was I was thinking I'm gonna do this, and then I saw a guy doing that on a 95 degree day. I'm like, I went right about it. <laughs> I yeah. one, of, one of the things one of the things with pasta is you you get potentially less of a return because the unmalted grain. Mm. soaks up a bit more and you have to use more grain in it as well like we go about oh. uh, 300 kgs over where we go with our single malt so it's probably not as kind of happy from the from an accountant side of things from sure. a business side of things but it's definitely something that we love to do and we love seeing and it's, it's growing but single malt is the recognition right now we'd love to get pot still up there to be the recognized for mm. ireland but single malt is what's recognized so it's still coming along and it's still growing and it will still get as still as more and more to come to it and like to to your point, Alan, it, it, it's up to us as a industry to really educate the consumer on what is pot still whiskey, single yeah. pot still whiskey, uh, because the confusion is the pot still is the apparatus, but it's it's also you know it's distilled in a pot still, but pot still in Irish whiskey is a style. And what I always try to do is to to bring it down to the consumer, the whiskey enthusiast, is that you know it's the introduction introduction rather of unmalted or green barley when you're using green barley it's an oilier it because it's like it's green it's alive it's an oilier grain so the, the actual oils are going to be captured within that through post distillation so i sort of define pot still whiskey as having sort of two characteristics it has this uh, big viscosity super 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 oily almost chewy whiskey you say that there's you know, there's often it's said that there's eating and drinking in a glass of pot still whiskey. So one is the viscosity, and then secondly, it has this sort of like tangy spice to it, and um, that that is really uh, Irish pot still is known for. So I sort of bring it to that characteristic, and it seems to resonate with consumers because they sort of sort of seem to get it from there. Definitely, like understanding your consumer and who you're talking to and what they, the, maybe the language that they speak and they understand really makes a big part mm. of it as well. So if you're talking to somebody who maybe understands bourbon better, I'd compare a bourbon to a single malt and a pot still to a rye to bring that spice and that sort of flavor profile through. Mm. And then the oiliness definitely adds to it. And you can, yeah. you can play into the oiliness. You can work with it and you can actually do things with it. Like as example, our last pot still release, single pot still five, we just did whole maturation in bourbon. And that vanilla, mm. that sweetness from the bourbon, along with that oiliness, gave you kind of like a butterscotch, kind of toffee kind of note out of it. And it really kind of, and it just washed over you and it stayed and it really became big flavor out of it, which sometimes you don't always get on, in the last in a pot still because you get that spice, you get a bit kind of more of a lighter flavor, but that bourbon really came to life with it. So it's about playing with those casts and understanding and really getting the best you can out of them to bring the flavor that you want from a pot still. Alan, really I, I, I really think that we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to do a bit of swapping after this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lou, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. I'm just saying it's, it's, right. it's, it's really good to hear uh, distillers talking well about bourbon barrels because they get they get trashed so often, and I think it's largely because um, they're cheap. They're they're you know ubiquitous, and mm. so any chance to do something different is automatically seen as better it's it's different you know I suppose what, what you lose in we'll say maybe color in bourbon barrels you get it in flavor so people mm. tend to drink with their eyes as well and i know uh, i know the guys from glenn i know ourselves like we pride ourselves being natural in color like so maybe sometimes the whiskeys don't always look like people think but the flavor comes in a big way because bourbon although it doesn't give you a big punch of gold and amber it's a light kind of hay straw color it does deliver flavor and people have, tend to kind of always look at whiskeys oh that's a bit light maybe i don't like that but when they start to open up and drink and actually understand them you start to get and bourbon adds fantastic characters mm. as well. i, I the remember majority, I had a... the majority of our um whiskeys are bourbon cask aged and then a secondary finish mm. and bur bourbon casks are great for, for for sort of knocking the edges off off the whiskey, laying yeah, that foundation of sweetness, yeah. um, that, that butterscotch toffee vanilla, and uh, we love that because you can it sort of it sort of rests the whiskey, and then you can liven it up with another cask as well. Like you know, say for our double barrel, we use Olorosa sherry, and that's going to add a completely different characteristic. But like bourbon casks are huge, um, and I believe in the year two thousand, there's a statistic that ninety seven percent of Irish whiskey was aged in bourbon casks. 
That's wow. It's crazy. Well, you know, we're making a lot of them. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. bourbon is just, <laughs> and it's almost a question of where the hell are we going to send these things? Um, so, so that's great. I mean, that's good. I wish ser- sh- they were selling more sherry, to be honest. Um, so we can yeah. get more of that wood too. Yeah. Um, but we just don't. Um, uh, we did mention briefly Pochin. Is Pochin whiskey or is it Pochin? Oh, this oh is, this here we go. A, uh, here we go. This is a, this is a, 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 a sort of bag of worms or whatever it is. Because uh, there's yeah. a separate section in the technical file for Pochin, right? It's not. Yes. Yeah, it's not like so, a subsection of whiskey. It's a. So Pochin is a precursor to whiskey. Uh, you know, it dates back to the earliest distillates um, in monastic settlements by Irish monks. They they came across the art form of distillation, where they're still in, in, in Greece for perfume, uh, for aromatics, and they bring it back to Ireland where they started to purify beer. This is where you get the, the, the term Ishkabaha, water of life, which was anglicized to Ishti and then whiskey. It's also called Puchin, and Puchin comes from a slang term for a pot still. So Puchin in, in Gaelic and in, in Irish means like what comes off a pot still. So it's almost a slang term about it. But Puchin and whiskey and Ishkabaha uh, were all interchangeable in Ireland. Uh, right up until 1661, where King Charles II made all distillation illegal on Christmas Day, because he's a bit of a bastard, um, because distilling was rampant <laughs> in, the, in the island of Ireland. And like Alan talked about, the Irish were, were very good at evading tax. So after that Christmas Day, you'd have to get a grant to distill from the English. And then they, they started to really hone in on the pot still. They honed in on, on the grains that we use, settled on malted barley. They started to age their, their liquid, age their distillate and sherry mid port. And that's where you get your single malt and then later on your single pot still. But your rural distillers kept on distilling this, this malt whiskey distillate called Puchin. And it's very, you know, it's, it's very ingrained into culture. There are certain regions and certain families in Ireland that still make it in a very, very historic way. Uh, you know, some people will call it uh, Irish moonshine. I think that's uh, insulting. I think I think moonshine's a poor imitation of Puchin. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of folklore around it. They have, people will actually rub it on their hands for arthritis. Doesn't do anything, but they do it anyway. People <laughs> rub it on, on greyhounds um, before races to, to warm them up. I don't think that does anything any anyway. But there's this history of folklore around distillation and the fairies. You have to put the first drop out on the ground for the fairies. And yeah, it was it, it was fought tooth and nail by the English to really stamp it out. And they used to put community fines on a, a whole township would be fined if there was a, a wow. pot still found on it. Huge cat and mouse games. Some was actually documented by Aeneas Coffey. He was in an in, in, inter, into right. an exchange with that where he, I think he got stabbed through the like his abdomen in that one. So it's vicious, vicious. But there's a very there's a big depth of uh, of history and heritage. We, we do we did a punch We still do a punch There's not a lot of people buy it. Um, but yeah, so we we have a big history of, uh, of making punch Love it. Interesting. Some people. Enough. I'll just say one more thing. So people ask, uh, how, how do you drink poutine? And it's in a rush with a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Keeping that one. It's actually <laughs> interesting enough as we're all on this call. It was through the poutine that myself and Donald actually met about 10 years ago. I was running a bar in Dublin and he was just launching yeah. it. And he came in to discuss it with me. Yeah. 10 years ago, yeah. I sent you over the photo. <laughs> we, we did a, a cocktail competition with Puchin about 10 years ago. I sent you over the photo there a while ago. Ah, Jesus, time flies when you're having fun. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so, um, the technical file, we've been we've mentioned it a couple of times. Let's talk about it. Uh, the product specification sheet. Uh, that's um, setting a regulatory definition, a regulatory definition on Irish whiskey. Um, when did that take effect? 2015, 2014? 2012, I think. I think it was yeah. 2012. Uh, I don't. Okay. I don't want to Google it. I'm just going to pretend. Yeah, I don't either. It's, it's 2012, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. there are um, there are already amendments to it. Um, Alan, you said they've already been been approved. It's just waiting yes. to take effect. 
So currently, the big the biggest change is going to be on the single pot still category. Yeah, um, that's a big one. Where we sit right now, when you're making a single pot still, like I said, it's a combination of malted and unmalted barley. You use minimum 51% malted barley. You use unmalted barley, but you can use 5% of other grain. This is going to change in a big way. We'll hold on to the minimum 51% of malted, but you'll now get up to 30% of other grain, which is going to open up, like where we talk about Irish being experimental, and we do so much already with whiskey and experimenting with casts and the whole lot. This is going to bring new life again into Irish whiskey to so show exactly what we can do, bringing in more like rye grains, bringing in more wheat grains, bringing in anything really we want as, mm. as grain form to actually make our whiskey. So speaking to a lot of guys out there, a lot of distillers, speaking to our own master distiller, Graham Cool, we're going to continue to make our pot still as we make our pot still, but we'd be silly not to experiment with something in the middle of it because it's such an amazing opportunity. Sure, some around, add-ons. Create something new. Yeah. Mm. And I think uh, part of the force around that was uh, and the sort of argument to do that was looking back historically at some of these recipes right. they did call for oats yeah. rye wheat and there was like historical evidence that that was used within what was called pot still whiskey at the time so i think it, even when we started um 11 years ago the technical file was very restrictive in terms of pot still capacity in terms of actually moving uh, distillate or even bring it in like a bring it in a wash or a beer uh, so there was a lot of restrictions to that and then you know the Irish Whiskey Association very much opened that up uh, and you know we're seeing the benefits of that now that there's 47 distilleries in Ireland but prior prior to this prior to um, 11 12 years ago you you would need like 10 million to, to open up a distillery wow. and it, it, was, it was crazy because the, the actual pot still capacity to buy a pot still of that size uh was going to cost a huge 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 amount so the irish whiskey association has been very good at you know finding the well you know when these uh, sort of barriers are identified that we can overcome them while still protecting irish whiskey uh, abroad and all the countries that, that we export to I, I was i think the thing that impressed me the most about this uh recent uh set of amendments was how relatively easy and painless it was I mean, here in the here in the U.S., that kind of thing is, I mean, wow, it's a big freaking deal, and it takes forever. Um, mm. And you guys seem to have gotten it done in about three years, which is great. Yeah, I suppose we're lucky in a way where we're we're only, I suppose, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't hesitate to call it. Well, I wouldn't call it in our infancy, but we're still kind of coming. Sure. In, we still like, we, like so we're only up to forty-seven or odd distilleries in Ireland. There's probably less voices right now making a lot of noise and it, we have a lot more freedom in what we're doing and people are more willing to change because a majority of these have only been founded in the last number of years so they're not set to the old ways they're not set to the way it's been done for mm. hundreds of years and they're trying to be creative and trying to we're looking at the global market we're looking at scotch whiskey we're looking at bourbon we're looking at japanese we're looking at all the whiskeys being produced out there i'm trying to see what are they doing and what can we do differently to help irish stand out and we're willing to do that to help us all progress and help us all go forward. And we're such a small community of people. We all know each other. Like I said, we all go to these shows. Yeah. We all know each other. We all chat. We're all there to help and we're all open to talk to each other. There's no rivalries or hatreds or anything within the Irish whiskey world. We're all there. To, we're all there to help each other. And it's a fantastic community to be a part of. 100%. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. There is a great sense of sort of co competition. Um, you know, that, that like a rising tide lifts all boats type of thing. And I think, you know, probably in about that, like that 12 years ago, there was a, there was a risk that Irish whiskey was going to be, you know, there's a risk that it was one brand. Yeah. That Irish whiskey would be one brand. And I think a lot of these um, sort of the allowances within the technical file are really set there to ensure that we're going to have a sort of flourishing category um, of a variety of different styles of different flavor profiles of different price points and and I think this uh, now I think I, Irish whiskey has the, the greatest amount for, for innovation and sort of flavor experiments than any other category you talk about you know you talk about bourbon Canadian all of that I think within Irish whiskey you look, there, there's just huge areas of growth within innovation and just, just interest in whiskey is coming from Ireland yeah, I, I I keep feeling that we're, um, you know, that we're, so many people still think of it as as two brands, and yeah. we just have, well, 
I was going to say we have so much work to do. We have a lot of fun work to do. Because um, mm. that's, I mean, it's interesting stuff. I love getting out there and showing people stuff they've never had before. I mean, just the stories on on some of your, uh, both of your uh, whiskeys is enough to get people to try it. And of course, once they, once they try it, okay. Like I, I love breaking down when you're doing a whiskey tasting, uh, whether it's like at a store or a seminar or what have you like that. Yeah, I love breaking down when someone is have, has only tried one Irish whiskey or has never tried Irish whiskey or is a bourbon drinker. That yeah. with our sort of core portfolio, I'd start them off with a single grain, with that, which is our double barrel, which I have right here. To do. <laughs> Just um, <happen> to have <laughs> but, which is light and sweet which has a complexity to it and then i'll go to a pot still whiskey after that which is like the polar opposite yeah and then after that i'll go to a malt whiskey which um our misnara cast which is crazy and no one can pigeonhole that so now you've tasted three completely different uh expressions and if you have to map them out in the flavor map they're all all over the place couldn't be more different and then that's the conversation they go, yeah. oh, I didn't know Irish whiskey was like that. That's the conversation to take them through. And you've taken them through the three styles that you can make on the island of Ireland. And I know with the with the, the Dingle portfolio, with their, the malt whiskeys and, uh, and and the pot still whiskeys, it blows people away. You have these people that are into their rise, into their single malt scotches and what have you like that. They taste the Dingle stuff and, the, you know, it's mic drop. I suppose one thing as well that really helps us, I, Irish whiskey as a category, is mm. the inherent Irish, I'd, I'd say, ability or obsession with telling a story. <laughs> we all have a... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've told one or two already in the middle of this call, but like we all have our stories. <laughs> and so there's, brands, yeah. there's brands out there all over the world that are probably screaming for their story, that want their story, that want to be able to tell their story, but they don't know what it is themselves. Where we like are very lucky, we have such a history and we have such a love for our history and our culture that we're telling stories all the time be it Glendalough talking about St. Kevin and how he was how he founded Glendalough itself and the the stories that he had in those seven years he spelt in the wilderness. Be it us in Dingle, we have the Renboy, which is on the front of our bottle, which is massively important to the culture and the history of Dingle as a town. And the Renboy is all about a festival that's held the day after Christmas Day and Dingle has the longest running a festival of this, the Rens Festival. And it's a big part of the town. Like we love telling a story and that's when people start listening going to tastings, going to seminars, doing everything, they don't necessarily get a tasting. They get a, a storytelling session from us with a bit of whiskey on the side of it. But that's what people love. And that's what's really making Irish whiskey so exciting is the stories behind it and the stories that we're bringing to the world. I, I think the whiskey and the storytelling, I think they're, they're somehow related. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe a bit. <laughs> Just a little uh, bit. We've, been, we've been talking uh, now here about the, um, the technical fire, the regulatory aspects of this. And then uh, uh, you guys both just talked about taking it to the consumer. How does the technical file, how does defining Irish whiskey in a regulatory sense, how does that help the consumer? What can the consumer expect to benefit from those? Because, I mean, you know, as a consumer, usually regulations are a pain in my ass. How is this a, how is this a good thing? Well, it helps us define what we're doing and it helps us define mm -hmm. what is. So you can talk to a person and tell them this is what a single malt is this is what a single pot still is and we all have to live by these rules but again the it, it, we define it in a way that we show people what it is but then we talk about it as an individual study for okay you we take that but this is what we do it like, when we do tastings we love taking out our new make showing people what it tastes like just off the still we're very high in ester we've got some really nice fruity notes to it but then we show them the impact that the barrel has had so the, the technical file will only bring you as far as saying what a single malt is, what a single pot still. After that, it's what you do and what how you express your distillery. Like when I talk about our single malt, the blue label bottle here behind me, we age full maturation in bourbon and Pedro Jimenez sherry cask, and we're majority Pedro Jimenez sherry. And that's what makes us individual and us different. And when you talk about even our aging in Dingle, everything we have in our bottle, we're making, we're lucky to make ourselves in the distillery and we're looking to age ourselves. 40% of what we have came out of bourbon. 40% we have came out of sherry, 10% goes into port, but then 10% is experimental. We're sitting on numerous types of rum casks, Amatillo, Champagne, Cognac, uh, Tequila, Mezcal, stuff that we're just kind of experiment, play around with. So the technical mm. file will bring us to, this is what a single malt is, this is what a single pot still, but it's almost impossible to define it in that area for ourselves because what we do after that 
it might put Glendale out with their Mizanora cask. It opens up to so much more. It's not just about being a single malt, being a pot still. It's being an Irish mm. whiskey. Yeah, and what I would, yeah, and I couldn't couldn't agree more, Alan. I think what the the technical the technical file does it defines what Irish whiskey is and protects it abroad. And you know, the, the, you know, there's people who would say, oh, Irish style whiskey or what have you like that, or just uh, you know, make imitation Irish whiskey around the world. And you know, I think the Irish Whiskey Association can go to the technical file and say that's not Irish whiskey. You can't put that on your label because it wasn't made in Ireland. It's not of it's not single grain, single malt, single pots or a blend thereof. Um, you know, so it sort of protects us as a category. Same way the Scotch Whiskey Association does with their with with, the, with their technical file. I think the changes that we've discussed earlier, I think it just opens up innovation, uh, expanding flavor profiles and, and keeps energy in the category around innovation and interest in whiskeys to come and sort of sets us up to establish more and more Irish whiskey as, um, you know, taking, taking the back its rightful place as a world whiskey producer, you know, one of the top world, producers, world whiskey producers in the world. Try to say that after like three whiskeys. That's that 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 was a that's a that's a mouthful there. Um, but yeah, that would be my thoughts on it. Well, um, let me take it in a really different direction, and I mean, it's not anything that you're involved with, so I, we we should be able to talk about this. Um, there's a long history of whiskey bonders in Ireland. Um, companies that would buy uh, barrels from distilleries, blend them, or just straight up uh, sell them as single barrels, whatever. Um, does an Irish whiskey brand, given that history, need a distillery to be taken seriously? I don't think, no, I don't think so. And, you know, what, what I reference is uh, Louisa J.J. Curry. Uh, she, she's a whiskey bonder and she does some really fantastic whiskeys. She sources different barrels from different distilleries. Um, you know, there's a great, great history of, of bonders. And, you know, even if you look at some of the really, really old um, imagery and stuff like that, you'd have like liquor stores or merchants, they would buy barrels and then bottle it themselves, put their name on it and say it could be from, you know, William James and George Rowe, what have you in, in Dublin back in the day. All of those bottles, they were, they're hand bottled by merchants who were bonders. Mm -hmm. So there's a rich history to that. And I think um, you can just do, like, Louise does really cool stuff. Um, and she's been experimenting with a lot of things. So I think it's just good for the category because it's, it's and, interesting. And she's, she's aging as well, right? Yeah, she's bu buying barrels. Yeah, she's not just buying, buying barrels and dumping them. And, yeah. No, no. And, yeah. And, and a lot of transparency in terms of the blends, exactly what's in it. Some luxury blends, which is a a weird term where it's like you're blending 27 <laughs> years in with this, with that, with that, with that, and just full transparency in the back of the bottle, exactly what's in it and it's developing flavor profiles. I think it's cool. I have a, I have a couple of her bottles, but a big, big fan of what they do. Yeah, definitely. I think like there's skills involved in every aspect of whiskey and, you know, different distilleries are doing different things, be it a Waterford who are totally focusing on the terroir and their grain, be it <laughs> the likes of ourselves, we're focusing on the barrels and the cask reason. Obviously, distillation is important, but we're big about our casks. When I describe to people, when I'm talking to people about whiskey and how whiskey's made, there's probably three steps of making whiskey. There's distillation, which is science. There is aging, which is nature in itself. And then there's bottling, which is an art. And, you know, each one of them has their own individual skills. So just because somebody's not completing one of those skills doesn't mean they're not doing the job to get it there. They're showing showcasing the skills that they have. It's so like Dar Donald mentioned, somebody like JJ Carly is there. They're doing amazing work in what they're doing and what they're mm. specializing in. That's the product they're bringing to the world. So I don't think having a distillery is going to define a person or say, well, you know, they're not performing this particular skill. They're performing a skill. They're doing what they want to do to make their product and all power to them to be able to do that and really define. And as Don said as well, once you have transparency and everything, who can give out or who can have a gripe with it? They're doing mm -hmm. what, they, what they're loving and they're making it, they're enjoying doing it and they're having a great time out of it and making a business out of it. Is that not the dream for everybody? Yeah. And, um, just to, to follow up, you talked about transparency, about having what's, you know, what's in the whiskey on the, on the label. The, the Scotch Whiskey Association has been a little more, uh, what, I don't want to say hesitant because it's stronger than that. Um, that they are not as uh, transparent about what can go on the label. Um, and I think it's um, 
because they don't want you putting, oh, this is 20-year-old whiskey, and I have some 10-year-old in there too. Um, <laughs> um, but the, as I understand it, the, the labeling requirements in, in Ireland allow you to say exactly that. Is that, is that correct? Well, I, I just, from, from my uh, recent um, ju ju just experience with it is with the Irish Whiskey Association are pushing more for more transparency um, where you say if, if your whiskey is sourced, you say that it's sourced on the back of your label. Um, so like say, for instance, with, with Glen de Lock, we, we have some like age statement whiskey up there that says 25 25 years on it we weren't around 25 years ago so we've always we've always had like a hybrid model where we we, we purchased older stock from the from from uh, established distilleries we distill on site and we also do uh, we also have contract distillation for you know so we we'd have to we had to do that to set up um you know 11 years ago and there's a lot of distilleries that that do that because if you're looking at uh, at 47 distilleries and anything that has an age statement on it that's older than six, seven years uh, has to be from a, another distillery. So, yeah. so there's there's always been a lot of a lot of trading um, between distilleries, and that's historical. Like years ago, uh, Jameson and Bushmills used to trade between each other as two of the biggest distilleries with, with grain whiskies and stuff. So, that's historical. It's always been a thing in Irish whiskey, and a lot of guys, you know, they get set up. You know, yourself, you distill a whiskey you stick it in a bar and you stand and look at it for a minimum of three years like what are you going to do in the meantime put the money in the <laughs> distillery keep, keep spending money oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we were quite lucky and i know glenn locker as well we made gin and we both made some of the most popular yeah. irish gins out there so we were fantastically lucky to have that like we <clears throat> we we released whiskies in small amounts up until a couple of years ago. We had our, our small batch series that we released every year, but we really came to life with a, with a core expression last year. And we're starting to see more and more going on, but like people need to survive and it's, it's not an easy thing to get into and an easy business to get into Not at all. to do what they have to do. But in the meantime, like all of them as they're being transparent about it, but they're all sitting there going, well, we've made our own stuff as well. We just need to wait for that. Um, but we need yeah. to make something in the meantime. So they're, but they're, they're, again, they're, they're removing maybe that one skill out, but putting the skills elsewhere into their blending into what they're trying to do in a bottle. And there's, and there's different aspects really to the business. Being more credit for is blending. Blending needs to be. It's a it's a tremendous skill. It's extremely yeah. important. Big time. Sorry. Big no. time. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh no! And... <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> Uh, well, I was just going to, I was going to say like, um, you know, a lot of these startup distilleries, you know, I know when we started, we started with 600 grand. We didn't, you know, that, that, that was it, you know, and, um, you know, it's very difficult to get going with that. And distilling is one, one part of the business, obviously, you know, your age and your blend and all of that. Another aspect is, is, is going out into the world and selling it and creating yeah. a brand name like that, that, that's a huge part of it. And you know that costs money uh, to become established. Oh, I and thought it was it, all volunteer work. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and like, it's very, very difficult to get into some of these markets. Like in the US, there's a handful of importers that imp that will import whiskies, and a lot of them already have Irish whiskey. And um, you know, so so they have no interest in getting any more whiskey. So then there's a lot of it's very difficult. There's a lot of difficulty in getting to market and becoming established and building a brand as well yeah and the uh, the expansion of the category has got to help that because i mean i'm sure when you were starting up and you'd go to these people and they'd say oh no i have an irish whiskey and mm -hmm. irish whiskey yeah and like yeah i'd have more than one <laughs> that's where we're getting to yeah 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 oh um a kind of um, what a, a, a much more general question as we get towards the end here. Um, I mean, I've been <laughs> I've been asking this question for for years, almost since I started writing about whiskey. I remember uh, asking um, Dave Quinn about it years and years ago, like like fifteen, almost twenty years ago. W why is this an important question? Why is this an important que uh, discussion? Is it is it more critical for distillers to have the discussion? Should drinkers be involved? Um, is it more a question of regulation and labeling? Is it a, 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 a about managing expectations for the drinker? What's 
What's key about this? Why is it so important other than just saying, here's our whiskey, we made it in Ireland? There's well, I, there's, there's a lot for people. Oh, sorry, Tom, do you want to go? Ah, you go on, head on. No, <laughs> no, you go on. No, you go on. No, you go on. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. There's a I'm lot not going. People. It's got to be one of you. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to understand within the categories. And I know there's always like the fight off of Scotch, Irish, American. Why should like in Ireland the the age old ad thing would have been why would I stock Scotch whiskey on in Ireland? And you get the same in Scotland, but like we're all making whiskey at the end of the day. You know, you'll have the fight between is there an E, is there not an E? Effectively, it's actually exactly the same wow, word. We didn't even talk about that. Yeah. Good. Effectively, <laughs> it's effectively like they were exactly the same words, be it Ishkaba or Ishkaba, and they were anglicized by invaders and they started calling it whiskey. So, you know, you can say there was no there was no such thing as the word of whiskey. So be it an E or without an E. It doesn't matter because the, the yeah. word never existed until they took our languages and bastardized them um, to create those words. So, you know, like, you know, I wonder what your political leanings are there, Alan. <laughs> but, <laughs> we all, but we're all, we are wishes. not going to talk about the Queen. We're just not going to do that. <laughs> is, is, it, but is, is the question Irish versus Scotch? Why Irish whiskey? Why American whiskey? Or just what whiskey? Why whiskey in general? Why would I drink any whiskey? It's about looking like people always tell you Scotch is peated, Irish isn't. It's not the truth. No. So like, so like it, why, why would we do this? Why would we kind of pinpoint? Why is Irish whiskey an answer? Or why is the category of Irish whiskey an answer for something right now? Because we have so much excitement. We have so much going on. We can be so different. We can bring so much life. And what we're seeing now is only the beginning of what Irish whiskey is going to be. Like we see brands out there like Jameson being a powerhouse all over the world and they're bringing Irish whiskey to PLA places and people that probably never would have had it before. But that's opening doors for all of us right. to follow after and for people to explore Irish whiskey. So I don't think the question is why Irish whiskey as in its category itself of Irish versus Scotch. It's, I suppose it is as well. It's we can be so much more creative right now. We can be so much more exciting and we can bring so much more to the world in flavor profiles, in maturation and just decision on casks in the mash bill in all of this that irish whiskey just has so much more to give right now and has so much more about it that it, it's such an amazing category to choose because you know glendalough could make a single malt in a sherry cask i can make a single malt in a sherry cask somebody else can do it but you're going to get three different whiskeys out of it yeah. Um, yeah. so because we have so much imagination right now in irish whiskey and we have so much freedom so that's probably the fun of it. That's why I'd say people, anybody, to start discovering, looking, tasting Irish whiskey, because what we're seeing right now is just the tip of the iceberg. We're about to blow people's minds. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, for, for, for me, I think this this is an important question because it, it allows us to have conversations like this. Um, you know, the uh, Irish whiskey category um, is very complex. You know, you look at the history, the heritage, the rise, the fall, the rebirth rebirth 2.0 which i think we're in right now uh, and it, it allows us to address with consumers and sort of explain uh, more and have these conversations to to get more of an interest in in irish whiskey so when we talk about w what makes an irish whiskey an irish whiskey that, that's a jumping off point to get into a conversation like we've all had here today to look at single malt single pot single, single grain talk about maturation cast selection blending all of that because there's a lot more to irish whiskey than shots in irish bars and dive bars it, you know that's what it was known as uh when, yeah. when myself and alan were coming up uh with with glendalock and with dingle that's that's all it was known as in the us and it was overlooked by a lot of whiskey uh consumers and now we're, we're here to tell our story and it, it's a great story to tell I, I keep thinking of other things we can talk about. Um, two that come to mind, uh, Irish whiskey has been woefully underused in cocktails uh, outside of highballs, which I think is the thing that everybody comes to mind with. Um, do you see that changing? And two, um, single grain. I mean, grain whiskey seems to do better for Irish distillers than for Scotch distillers, at least in America. I see... I see more of of the small distillers single grains on the shelves than I I well I've I don't believe I've ever seen a Scottish single grain on the shelf in in America. So two opportunities. What uh, what do we have on that? 
Well, I can jump in in terms of the single grain. Um, like our our flagship whiskey is our double barrel. I'll show it again there, just in case you didn't see it last time. <laughs> um, but single grain is, is very much an underutilized style of, of, of whiskey from Ireland that actually originated in Ireland with Aeneas Coffee, who was chasing around putching distillers, illicit distillers in the early 1800s, became fanatical in how putching distillers were distilling, thought it was extremely inefficient. He developed the coffee still, uh, <laughs> continuous coffee still, named it after himself. Um, this is like the he, idea of a cop running around and saying, wait a minute, I have a better idea for Robin Banks. Exactly, yeah. I can and do he, this. And he, he wondered why, why people didn't, he's a British tax agent and he invents a still and he tries to authorize yeah. in Ireland. Of course he said no, because there's some type of trick here. So uh, we didn't really adopt it within Ireland um, until we started to popularize blends in, you know, in, in the 60s and in the 70s. So to our detriment, uh, we didn't adopt it, but it was adopted in Scotland, Japan, with Janika, coffee grain, coffee malt, the majority of your bourbon. Yeah. Uh, but it's a beautiful, light, bright style that's great for absolutely sucking the marrow out of the cask. It gets huge, huge, huge mm. flavor from the cask. And we, we use it to... A bourbon cask age into an Olorosa sherry cask age gets into what we we're talking about the bourbon cask earlier, and then the the Olorosa sherry gives a beautiful uh, uh, sort of like dark cherry fig, tobacco nuttiness, all of that to it. But we love it uh, for bourbon drinkers. Tend to gravi mm. gravitate towards single grain has it has a, a big percentage of, 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 of yeah a big, big yeah. percentage of um, of corn small percentage of malted barley and uh, you have that bourbon cask agent to it as well it gives us some of the sweetness so we really find a home for it there is, is grabbing bourbon drinkers over to irish whiskey uh with with our double barrel and then showing them more and more of the styles like we talked about with the pot still and uh single malt i think there's yeah. a great opportunity in, in celebrating single grain and i think it's a lot around the, just the, the cask aging of single grain it just picks up character so so quickly We've done a couple of experiments with some single cast stuff in, in, in that space. Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, people don't even know what the heck it is. I mean, I would say probably 98% of, of whiskey drinkers, even scotch drinkers, probably don't even know. Again, more education is needed. I'm mm. on it well, for what that's, that's worth. <laughs> All right, Lou. I, I just, Alan, I think we pack it in. Lou's got this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so um, I'll, I'll, sorry. Touch on, I'll touch on the cocktail point if you like. Yeah, my my background being a bartender, and that's what I started off. We said that's how I met Donald. Um, it's definitely becoming more and more used in cocktails, more and more parents. Like it, it. I suppose we start when we started this whole conversation. Uh, Donald mentioned that you know people got used to Irish whiskeys being those light blended styles of whiskeys, and you know mm -hmm. maybe they didn't hold up well in drinks. Um, but we are seeing so much more life. Good point. I, I keep saying life, but we're seeing so much more coming to Irish whiskey. We're seeing so much flavor, some flavor, some like sherry bombs, bourbon bombs, big punchy flavors coming through in whiskeys, which is making the whole uh, bartending mixology side of things a lot better. And like people are starting to experiment. Like we're seeing bars like the Dead Rabbit in New York. We're seeing the likes of 1661 in Dublin, Cask and Cork. We're seeing these amazing, amazing cocktail bars opening up. And they're really like doing fantastic work and really, really bringing life to Irish whiskey and looking how they're mixing it. But it's for us to really bring those flavors and whiskeys forward to get them to use. But it's giving so much more opportunity than we'll say your typical scotches or your even bourbons because they're so multifaceted that, you know, you can use a different whiskey to deliver a different flavor altogether in Irish whiskey because there's such variants. So I think we're going to see a lot more of Irish whiskey in cocktails. We're going to see a lot more people experimenting with it. And we're going to see it becoming a lot more apparent in the world around us that Irish whiskey is really doing such amazing things. Like I said, the bars that are out there, they're doing such amazing work and we can name a hundred of them. Even there's probably one I didn't mention was Homeboy in London are doing a fantastic job in Irish hospitality, but in Irish cocktails and Irish whiskey drinks, especially they've really kind of set a standard in a big city like London and shown people that Irish whiskey is something to be seen and something to be explored. Like I said, the likes of Dead Rabbit in New York. So it is coming up. It is getting better and we're going to see a lot more of it. I think I think you touched on it really well there, Alan. It's because the flavor profile was one way, and and I think that's why it was very much overlooked within cocktails. And now that we're like from everything we've talked about, I, I think that the big takeaway is you know is innovation and expanded flavor profiles and 
the interest in whiskies coming from Ireland. The more interest in whiskies that come from Ireland, the more they're going to be utilized within cocktails. Yeah. 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 Once you, t- once you get to the bartenders and get them interested, they're going to start yeah. working with it. Yeah. And that's it. Um, gentlemen, we're, we're about out of time. Um, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been educational and I, you know, I keep getting this feeling. I've just been thinking about this for the last 15 minutes. This, this huge unlabeled bottle of Irish whiskey being wheeled out to the launch pad. And we're, you know, we're about to take off. It's, it's reaching I, 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 I think we, we've solved a lot of the problems. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Right here. All, in fairness. <laughs> but, and, yeah, we, we, listen to this. If you don't go out and buy 10 bottles of Irish whiskey, uh, we're, 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 we're not sad. We're just disappointed. <laughs> uh, I think we've definitely, gentlemen. we've definitely strapped that rocket onto it. So let's let it fly. Yeah. 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 We're ready to roll. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you for much. joining us. Uh, thank you everyone who, uh, who, who drops in and, and gives a listen. We'll, uh, I don't know. We may be back. Although, like you said, we seem to have solved everything. So <laughs> maybe we can just spend an hour talking about how great shit is. That'll be- <laughs> Next time we do it out of power, right? Yeah, that'll be better. <laughs> All right. Donald, Alan, it's good so- to see you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very Thank much. much. Take care. Thank you all for tuning in. These table talks take place live here on YouTube Wednesdays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern. 5.45 p.m. Pacific. You can also log on to www.beverage.co to watch find, watch and find past talks or to check out the Beverage channel where you'll find lots of other spirits-related content. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Again, I'm Lou Bryson, uh, the author of Whiskey Masterclass and Tasting Whiskey, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>